I am so sorry, I am so late. <laughs> Yeah, bad traffic. Um, yeah, horrendous. So I have said that if anyone wants me to buy them a drink after this for making them wait, I'm happy to. I'll send you my PayPal details. <laughs> um, I may take you up on that. Um, yeah, no, please do. <laughs> so thank you very much for coming to Oxford today, um, Mr. Kemp. Um, I suppose we'll start at, at the beginning. You can call me Roman this way. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, with, your, with your childhood. Um, obviously, both your parents were famous musicians. Your dad was in Spandau Ballet and your mother was in Pepsi and Shirley. And George Martin was your godfather. Yeah. Um, do you think you had an unusual childhood as a result? Um, I would say it's, it's difficult because for me it's like it's all I've known. So it's, you know, all I, all I know is, is, uh, is, is growing up with, you know, my, my, my parents and obviously my godparents. And I, I think that to everyone else and understandably it is strange. It's weird. It's not normal. Um, but to me it was something that... To be totally honest, I think it's helped me later on in life being able to do the job that I do because you, you stop, you, your values are different, I feel, you know, and, and I think for, I was very, very lucky that I saw, you know, especially with, with, with people like George Michael, you see, you see fame at such a high level and you realise that that's not necessarily the best thing sometimes and, and, and I think that because I had that, it was, it, it kind of put a ceiling to fame if that made sense. Whereas a lot of people, I think when they're coming up and they're trying to do their career, they see like, you just got to keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger when you think that will bring better things and sometimes it doesn't. Mm. So, uh, but that being said, I had a hugely privileged childhood. I had every, I've had every um, Christmas present, birthday present, anything I ever wanted was, was mine. And, and, and I'm so you know, grateful for that. I'm still one of the only kids at my friend group whose parents are still together. Mm. You know, so a hugely loving family and, and one that, that supported me nonstop, yeah. So were you aware of the fame of your parents when you were a child? Is there a moment when it sort of first hit you? That yeah, uh, yeah, I think so. Um, I, I, I kind of like, it was normal for a while and then I think, um, to use the word clout, um, uh, it aptly was, was basically when uh, we had like a school I can't remember what year I would have been in, probably about year one, year two. And they bring the fire truck to school. And, uh, and they were, yeah, it must have been year two. They bring the fire truck to school and the firemen are all there and they're all like, you know, saying, oh, this is, this is the hose, this is the outfits we wear, these are the list of people's lives that we've saved. And I stood up uh, as a young, egotistical, conf confident child and said, you think that's cool, but my dad's Steve Owen in EastEnders. And because uh, that was a character at the time, right? And, and uh, that was, I think, the realisation that this can hold a bit of weight. But I've always been insanely proud of my parents at the same time. Like a lot of kids, what I always see, and I always, you know, and look, I love him to death. And he'll, he might see this interview or a video somewhere, but I'll still say it. Like, I always find it very strange. Like my cousin, for instance, is someone that kind of dropped his surname like didn't didn't want that to be out there in the public whereas for me that's who i am and that's who i've grown up with and, I, and I've, i'm hugely proud of my parents you know i've never been someone to think you know you see a lot of kids of celebrities that are like no i don't want anything to do with them like get me away from you know i'll go anti I was, I was about to say, what could I go anti against? Anti EastEnders, what, I'm going to go into Corey. <laughs> um, but do you know what I mean? Like, like it, it, and I've never been like that. I've, I've always been so, so, so proud of what my parents have done. You've also clearly been very interested in music from, from a young age. Yeah. Do you attribute this to your sort of... I was, I was kind of forced to. <laughs> I was kind of forced to. Um, my, my mum and dad, my mum brought me and my sister up saying, you're going to be songwriters. That was it. No, no anything it was it was you're gonna be songwriters because that's um you know that that's uh, such a creative outlet and uh, you know i've spoken about this before it, my, the first thing that the first album my mum ever bought me i was like seven was eminem the marshall mathers lp and you 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 ask any other kid at that age what albums were their parents giving them it ain't something that talks about vd do you know what i mean and like to this day i don't really know what still what it, it is you know but but it's <laughs> it, it's I don't know, but, but she loved the fact, and I think I took, I take so much inspiration from someone like, like him still now. 
And, and that's a very weird thing to say for someone in my job to say that Eminem is a massive <laughs> inspiration to me. But I mean it in a sense of he was one of my first kind of heroes. And my mum was always very up on, here's someone in a, in a bad situation. And um, here's someone in a bad situation that has understood that communicating their feelings and communicating how it's made them feel and, and, and how it can get better and how bad their life is and putting it in a creative way helps them, not only mentally, but also in a public sense, you know, as, as giving him millions of adorning fans or people that understand him, you know, and, and, and I think that that, again, was, to me, the, the power of honesty, you know, it, it from, from seeing a character like him. You know, I never forget, I, ne I never forget when, when I, you know, and I, I'm staying on Eminem for a second because, again, he was someone that I learned more than I realised at the time. There was a film, ha I mean, this is, feels weird for me to even say, have you all seen the film Eight Mile? Have you ever seen that film? So there's an Eminem, there's an Eminem made a movie called Eight Mile, right? Watch it, it's sick, it's so good, right? It's basically like his upbringing uh, and like him going to like battle raps against the other rappers. And, not to ruin the film for you, but there, there is a rap battle that he has towards the end. And you can search this on YouTube if you don't want to watch the whole film, just like final rap, right? And in that, he, um, in that last kind of rap battle, he uh, goes up on stage and instead of rapping about the person that's in front of him and saying, you know, your pants are whack or like all this stuff or your mum and this and that, he literally goes up there and looks this other person in, in the eye and says everything that's bad about himself and faces up all of his own insecurities and tells his own insecurities to this person saying, yeah, my girlfriend probably fancies you more and all those types of things and everything that he felt was being targeted at him, he just put back on that person. And the second he did that, the other rapper now has nothing to talk about and he, he can't say anything. And I, I took that as a kid really in the sense of I, I started doing that throughout my life and I think I've always done that. Whenever I get up on stage, you know, people will always say to me, you know, I'll, I'm lucky enough and fortunate enough to host, like, Summertime Ball, which is like 80,000 people at Wembley Stadium. And I remember the first time that, you know, the first time that I ever did it, I was like, you know, so many people are probably going to be like, oh, why is he doing this? He was 24, I was 24 years old when I was doing it. And I remember I was like, okay, I'm going to take from that what, what, I, um, what I learned and what gave him strength in that moment. And I went up on stage... And the first thing I said was, I imagine you were all so annoyed when you realised you hadn't booked Martin Kemp and instead you've booked his, his, his uh, androgynous looking son. Um, and, and instantly it took away this whole kind of weight and, you know, my, my theory that everyone was looking at me saying, oh, he's just here because of his dad, was, became a joke and it became, you know, something that I was addressing. So long story short, yes, very much into music. <laughs> So I suppose it's slightly separate from music and musician. When did you first realise you wanted to be a DJ specifically? That, that, do you know what? That was something that, in terms of radio, yeah. uh, that was, uh, that is someone coming to me, and, and I remember, and, and this is always, you know, I watched, um, I watched an interview with uh, David Bowie recently, and he said something so interesting, and I've always, I've always loved to, to live my life this way. And it's the people that, that make it and that can stay, you know, grounded at that same point and also will push themselves. Or if you imagine going, going into a swimming pool, you've got people in life that are three different types of people. You've got people that will try and show off or they'll jump in at the deep end, like straight in, can't touch the bottom and they'll try and stay afloat and those people will cause themselves to panic later on and they won't know how to get out of it they won't know what they're doing they'll get found out and they'll lose themselves you know whether that be they could still be successful they could still lose who they are or you've got the people in life who just stay in that shallow end and the water comes up to here and you're absolutely fine and you know your life and your life's kind of set out for you you know I constantly worry about oh my god am I just living my life just in the UK and that's it and that's all I'm going to do or you can be someone and you always try and push this. You know that point when you go into a swimming pool and you feel your toes just that far off. You're, you're that far off constantly and you feel yourself slowly walking out, seeing how far you can push it to that point where you just got to keep your head a little bit like that and you've got to tread water a little bit. That level of 
uncomfortableness is where I've always wanted to be. And that's where decisions like doing radio or things like, um, you know, I was, a, I was 19, I was 20, and, and someone asked me, can you go and film a music video in Rio? On your own, basically on your own. And I was just like, yeah, I couldn't do that. I was 20 years old, I was terrified. But if I didn't push myself to that little bit of uncomfortable level, then I wouldn't know what was on the other side and I wouldn't know if I can do it. So when I, I actually was working for a football company at the time and I was, I was just like, um, I was the runner. I was, I was the company's bitch, basically. Like, like I was, right? And, um, and, and I, I, I was like filming things and it was the World Cup and, and, and I was like, you know, all of the team went to, to it's a, a company called Copper 90, right? They're still massive on football and like they're, they're run by Google. And I was like a videographer at the time and, and I was like, look, like I can go out to Rio. I can do this, 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 this. I can help you out. Just please let me come to the World Cup. And, uh, and when they were like, nah, I was like, right, well, I can film something in London. What can we do? And we came up with this idea. It was terrible. It's called Man Versus Football. You can still look it up now, right? It's awful. One of the worst bits of work I've ever done. But it was also one of the best bits of work I've ever done because I put together this thing where I was running around. I set myself a challenge where I had to go to a different football bar of each different nationality in the World Cup for every different game. It sounds boring to watch. It is boring to watch, right? Wouldn't recommend it. But every time I was going to each of these places, I was working really hard, like, it, it, and, and like, you know, it's like two o'clock in the morning when some of those matches were kicking off. And I'm in like some Algerian bar in Edgware Road, uh, you know, and I don't know what I'm doing there. And, and I kept bumping into this boy who was similar age to me. And, um, and, and I kept bumping into him and, and he was really nice. And, but all of a sudden I'm like, you're at this bar with me. You're at this bar with me. Why are you in some random Belgian boozer with me? Like, are you following me? And he was like, he was like, no, no, no. I work for LBC and I'm getting um, sound bites of fans, you know, just saying, how did you find the game? What do you do? Blah, blah, blah. And, and a couple of times when I saw him there, I'd say to him, you know, how many sound bites you got? And he was, he was shy kind of guy. He was like, none really. And I was like, well, give me it. And literally I just, took this dictaphone off him, went round within five minutes and got 17, you know, uh, Vox Pops and, uh, and came back and said, there you go, let's have a pint. And if, it, if, I, if there was no one else in this bar, which sometimes there weren't, right, because you're in a Nigerian bar at two o'clock in the morning, right, and there was no, no one in there, um, or like, you know, if you're at a Dutch place or something like that, I'd just put on a Dutch accent and just pretend to be a fan. Probably wouldn't recommend doing that, especially in today's climate, but it, you know, it worked. And then kind of a couple of months after that, I then got approached to, to go and do a demo at Capital. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I had no idea why they reached out to me at all. I'd done a couple of YouTube things, but that was about it. Started doing some demos and they, they offered me a show, like graveyard shift show. And um, I went, yeah, of course, never done radio before. Don't know how it works, absolutely petrified, but again, trying to tread water on that much, you know, let's just do it. And so I did it and I got invited into the boss's office and the boss said to me, do you know how you got the job? And I was like, no idea. And he goes, he kept bumping into my son um, with the dictaphone. And he came home and was like, dad, I met this kid who, you know, like is running around, he's doing these accents and he's, you know, kind of just being an idiot and walking up to people and asking them things. And so that for me, you know, it always kind of, it just, you never, know, you never know who you're around and you never know who you're talking to and you never know who, you know, if you've got that drive, it just takes that one moment. And that moment, luckily for me, came early on. You know, I was a young kid, I was 22, right? That, that came early on. That moment could happen at any point in people's lives. You know, sometimes that can happen to actors who you see are like 40 years old that have done the auditions all their life, but that one person changes your life and that happens to me. Oh, well, thank you very much. I think... Now that we have some understanding of you and your background, I'd like to talk about something that's very personal to you and, and it's quite important to me as well. Um, you've been a very, very high profile, very active and um, diligent campaigner in raising awareness for men's mental health. And in March last year, you released your documentary. Um, 
uh, following the death of a very close friend of yours. Without wanting to ask too much about the events themselves, yeah. at what point did you decide that you wanted to make a documentary about this? Uh, really soon afterwards. Because I'll be totally honest with you, again, and you know, I've said this and it's well documented, that my, my feeling of grief and my understanding of grief was far from what... I've, I've always felt myself as a very strong and confident person. Not strong as in like, uh, I don't know, like macho, but I, I feel like I'm there enough to deal with something like that. And what I realised over time is that I wasn't. Grief is something that is absolutely horrendous. I've watched my friends go through it. I've watched, you know, family members go through it, but I'd never had it happen to me like that, you know, from that level. You know, losing, losing someone to suicide is, is so confusing. And, and I hated my best mate. His name was Joe. I hated him for it. I would literally wake up and swear at him every morning. I'd talk out loud to him. I'd find myself talking to him all the time. And... I hated him, I, I just really hated him and, 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 I, and I felt like I had been lied to. Everything that I had read about mental health, I felt like I had been lied to. I felt like, hang on a minute, I was told that people that kill themselves are people that are visibly low. People that are going to psychiatrists, people that are taking antidepressants. If I'm totally honest, I was told it was people like myself because at this point I'd been on antidepressants for 14 years and I had planned out how I was going to kill myself more than once and been stopped on the day to do, into doing it. And Joe was the complete opposite of that. Joe was someone that was, uh, yeah, no joke, I know people always say this, like, oh, it's the happiest person I know. It really was. Like, and it, what you realise is this thing that happens in people's brains when they decide to take their own life is something that you cannot, you cannot predict. You cannot do it. Uh, and, and making documentary was basically my own therapy and understanding of, excuse my language, what the fuck has happened. Like, because it was like, I had to do it for myself. And I always kind of see it as almost like exposure therapy. Um, which is like, you know, when you're a kid, and like, I don't know if anyone else had this in this room, like, you know, when you're a kid, and like, something really scares you. Like, it could be like something silly, like when you're a kid. And then, and then like, for Halloween, you want to be that thing for Halloween. Like, you know, when, when I was a kid, a lot of kids were scared of like Jason Voorhees with a hockey mask and the thing like that. And then all of a sudden, that Halloween, everyone's wearing that. And it's because you want to understand that thing, you want to become that thing, you want to em embrace it so much. And, that's how I kind of felt about suicide. I became obsessed with it in understanding how has this caused me this much pain. And that's when I decided I had to make the documentary. Obviously I had to speak to Joe's parents and I was never gonna go anywhere near it unless you know, Joe's parents allowed me to make that. I didn't care about, I, I'll be honest, and they know this, I, I, I didn't care about capital or anything like that. I didn't think about that. I didn't think about anything else in my career. A big worry that my parents had always had was because I'm still, you know, I guess, I, you know, I've been doing it for a long time, but I'm still relatively young in my career. My parents didn't want to go, oh, you'll now forever be known as a kid that's told everyone that they want, he wanted to kill himself or something like that, or attached to mental health. And I didn't care because I just felt like if if we can stop one person from taking their own life and stop them from feeling how I feel, we've done it. And, and so it was, a, it was more an obsession and, and selfishly just purely for me to make that documentary. Obviously just then and in the documentary, you speak very openly about your own struggles with mental health. Mm. What helped you to break the stigma about talking about it on a personal level? Um, I think it's difficult because, because for me, again, I, I've been so fortunate enough to, to grow up with the parents that I have and to grow up with the mum that I had specifically, who, you know, would show me people going back to him. I'll keep going for now. Um, Sorry, wait. Wait. Perfect. So, yes. Um, you just said how, in both in your documentary and um, just now in your talk, that 
you've struggled with mental health across yeah. your life. How did you break the stigma of talking about it publicly? Uh, like, like, yeah, no, like, I, like I said, was I, I was always very open because of my mum and, and I guess personally, I n I've never had a stigmatism about talking about it. I've always, I've always been the person that I am talking to you now. I've, I've, I've been that person. I've never wanted to talk about it like massively because I was a little bit worried about how it would look for my career, which you guys will learn like later on in your life. Like there are things that, you know, should you bring this up? Should you not talk about this? How is it going to help my career? And then some things are bigger than your career and, and you have to learn that those things have to come first. And, and, and that's what happened with me. Uh, you know, th this, this topic was something that I've spoken openly about to my mates. My mates are very aware that, that I've struggled for a long time. My parents are aware, not to certain extents. Um, but I've, I've, I've been very fortunate that I've been brought up in a very open household. Mm. Thank you. Um, did you expect the documentary to have the response that it, that it got and um, have you been pleased? Um, yeah, uh, I, I never watched it. Um, I never saw it. Um, I'd, I'd, I lived it. Uh, I'd, if I saw it again, I'll probably watch it at some point. Um, but I was outrageously overwhelmed. Outrageous, like, uh, I, 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 I couldn't, I didn't know what, I'd, what to do. I don't, I don't like, I like doing stuff as a team. I love doing stuff as a team. I love um, being able to um, create things as a team and, and, and win as a team. I become very, I don't get embarrassed. Like I have no embarrassment filter unless, I, I used to cry when people used to sing happy birthday when I was a kid. And so I don't know really how to handle people saying thank you or those types of things. I'm really bad with it. So much so that I'd rather just ignore it. Not ignore it, but just like try and brush it off as much as possible. I switched my phone off for like four days after the doc came out. Because I don't know. I, d I, I knew what I was, you, you know, you know, people, if they understood it, if they didn't understand it, they're still going to say, well done, you know, and they'll, they'll use that word brave and things like that. And it's like, it's hard because it's really hard to, you run a fine line in, in, in the public eye, you run a really, really fine line between like doing something for, for a good cause and coming across as virtue signaling. And that's very difficult to differentiate. You know, you don't know what celebrity is doing something because it, it will make them bigger or do you know what I mean? And, and, and that's a worry, you know, it is always a worry. And, and at that point, to be totally honest in my career, I, said, I didn't care. I didn't care. I, I, would, I would have quit my job or I would have whatever. But it was completely overwhelming. You know, now I get up to 200 emails a day sent into my team about uh, about people and you know the, the the struggles that they're going through or, or their parents or or their sons or their daughters or anything like that and it's you know you know it's hard i can be on a i can be on a night out and this is where it becomes really hard i could be on a night out i was in a nightclub the other day and i don't even go to nightclubs right i was in a nightclub and as i'm there someone pulls me aside and goes um I just wanted to talk to you about, about suicide, you know, about you losing your friend, you know, it's something that really affects me as well and all that type of stuff. That's hard. Because one, like, thank you for opening up. But two, I'm with all my mates and now you've just pulled me into that, you know. So you've got to learn how to manage it. And I, and I, and I do manage it, you know, in terms of, you know, I do therapy every now and again when I need it. I still take antidepressants. So, you know, I, I, I try and live my life in a, in a nice way. and. That's what I was scared about with the reaction. And that's why when I say overwhelming, yes, in a good way, but also in a strange way. Do you think that the way we talk about mental health, particularly men's mental health, has changed a lot in the last decade? We had Anthony Joshua here on Monday talking about mental health problems he's faced. And in a couple of weeks' time, Bear Grylls, who's been similarly outspoken, is coming here. Yeah. Um, do you, have you noticed how the last five to 10 years, the yeah. way discussions happen has changed? 100%, 100%. Uh, I, I, look, I, 
we're so we're so cynical, right? I don't read books, but there is one book that I've read in my life, and that was called uh, it's called Factfulness, right? And it's literally a book of showing all the cynicism that we have as like the human race to go oh, we're screwed, the world's dying, this is getting worse, everything's bad, and blah, 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 blah. In reality, it's not. We're, we're progressing at an amazing rate. You know, it's exponential growth. You know, there's the things like third world countries are becoming the thing of the past. And, and you know, more, more women are going to university than there were 100 years ago. You know, women in jobs or men, uh, you know, surviving big diseases that in the past they would get through. Because of people like you, you know, smart people like you in universities wanting to, to progress. And that, I think, is the same with mental health. It is getting better, but it just keeps needing that push. You know, the thing, the thing that I've, I've come around to realising, and this is only from my parents and, you know, other people telling me, is that you look at... So far, there's been three things, in my opinion. Um, you know, others, other people might have more. Um, AIDS, when AIDS was first, you know, around, people would call that... Um, you know, a, a dirty disease. It would be looked upon as shameful. It would be looked upon as something you don't talk about. You know, we all saw the It's a Sin program on, on Channel 4 and beautifully portrayed, you know, a parent's relationship with a son who had AIDS. That had to have a huge movement to be able to become a thing that was understood and looked after and, you know, and, and we're not afraid of it. You know, if, if people can walk around being HIV positive, you know what I mean? It, it's, it, that's something we had to learn about. The next thing was, was cancer and, and the growth of that and, and what we've seen over the last, you know, 20 years. In the beginning, it was, you know, people didn't really want to say they had cancer. It was just called the big C and it was this whole fear around it. You didn't really talk about it. You just tried to get rid of it. Nowadays, there's adverts everywhere, people doing incredible things um, in cancer research, and, and it's an understanding around it, you know, because it's been normalised within society. Still now, and this is what has to change, still now, people are afraid of the word suicide. They really are. I did, I did an interview with um, uh, Stephen Bartlett, the Diary of a CEO, a fantastic, lovely guy, like, amazing and uh, did his podcast and uh, it, was, it was with him that I first really realised it, you know, and, and, he, and he, he couldn't say the word, you know, and I noticed it more and more that people will walk around and, and if, you, if you talk to them about it and they'll say, you, you made that document, they'll talk to me and they'll say, you made the documentary about that, like, as if it's a swear word and you're like, you can say it, it's a, it's a completely normal thing, you know, it's the second biggest killer for, for men under 40. You know, it, it is no difference to you saying the word cancer or AIDS or things like that. And it's that stigmatism that has to kind of, I guess, finish. Uh, and, and, and that's where it, that will slowly happen. And the progression of that will happen. But now it's the realisation that you can't teach that to adults. And that's where everything for me is, is now going to be aimed towards, towards kids. I, I suppose we've sort of focused a bit on um, mental health and how to support individuals but a couple of weeks ago a good friend of mine who hadn't seen in a few years uh, shot himself and I found it very difficult to deal with sort of how you interact with the people that you know have seen them recently yeah. and, and are friends with them and family members what do you think is the best way to support the loved ones of suicide victims um, firstly I'm very sorry um, validation of feelings and, and that for me is is regard that should be something that humans in general it, it, I know that I could never be with a partner or my kids the one thing that I'd want them to know is validation of feelings and what I mean by that is I've always been someone that if I get in an argument with someone for instance if I know I'm completely in the right and I haven't really offended this person or I've said something and they're upset. It's not my right to tell them that they shouldn't be upset. And that's, you know, that's what I mean by, by that validation, that validation of, of you know, I understand uh, what I, I feel like I've done the right thing, but I understand that you're upset and I apologise to, and I always apologise because it's apologising that you feel like that. 
you know, because that's never the intention. And that's the thing with, with something like suicide, the grief on suicide is so confusing that you will have people that take it differently and you will have people that disassociate from it. People that go, it happens. You will have people who are devastated. You will have people who are angry, like myself, who don't even want to talk about that person. I don't want to hear, you know, I didn't want people to talk about Joe. I thought, what an asshole. What, you know, like, how could, how could he leave me, his mum, his dad and his sister? And I guess the thing that I needed at that point, which I got, luckily, you know, was, was validation of those feelings and under, an understanding. And, and again, it's, it's validation that, that is what we're trying to do when I go and talk to businesses, when you tell bosses, if an employee comes in and says to you, they're feeling this way, you can't just look at them up and down and go, well, physically you look fine, so go to work. You can't, you know, and, and, and that's, I think, what, what's so, so key with, uh, you know, dealing with anyone that's, that's been a victim of suicide. I suppose one final question on, on this topic. If someone came to you and said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm depressed, I'm considering killing myself or just I don't know what to do, whatever, yeah, yeah. what would be the sort of in four or five sentences, what would you say to them? Firstly, I think, having been there and know that it doesn't make a difference if you're at this point where you say you shouldn't do it because of this or this or this or this or this. It's again, it's just being there. It's being present with that person, not trying to tell them everything's fine, don't worry, don't worry. I'm already worrying, I'm already in this state. You know, don't worry is the worst thing you can say sometimes to, to people in that situation. But again, I, I feel like I have to use, you know, Joe's, Joe's mum's words were so brilliant to me. And this is someone that we shot this bit of film two and a half months after she's lost her son. And she's an amazing woman, Celia. And she, she said something that is really controversial, in my opinion. Suicide, again, the older generation will, will use this term of it's selfish, right? They will say it's a selfish thing to do. It's something that, you know, you, you don't care about anyone else. You don't care about the rest of your family. It's a selfish, shameful thing to do. What Celia said, Joe's mum, was that she kind of touched on that in a sense, because in a way it is, it is true. In that moment, you're not thinking about others. You are thinking about trying to get yourself some peace. But the way she phrases it is, whatever pain that you're feeling in that moment, that pain doesn't disappear when you go. Regardless of whether you're going to do it or not, that doesn't disappear that horrendous feeling that you have will never go. That will transfer to the people that you love forever. And not just that, it will transfer to their friends. It will transfer to the world. And, and, and that, for me, was enough to realise, you know, when she's there just saying, just please just stay, give it one more day. I, I gained such an understanding of it then that in my head, sometimes I did feel like, oh, you know, I just want peace. I, I, I want to be able to just get away from this and this, this problem is, is rubbish. You know, you've got to think about the fact that like 70% of men, like, you know, over 70% of men that, that do end up taking their own life, they, they don't even think that they have a mental health problem. They, they just see, I'm not where I want to be in my life. That's it. A lot of you sitting here will have in your head right now a path of where you're going to be. And I'm sure your parents maybe have brought you up saying, you're going to become this, you're going to do this in your life. Life doesn't work like that. It, it changes all the time, for good and for bad, all the time. And it's then when you have to be mentally strong. And it's then when you have to realise that whatever's going on, things will get better. It will get better over time. Time makes everything better. But a lot of men don't see past that. They see it's not going how it should be going. I'm out. I always refer to it as like, you know, I used to play FIFA all the time, still do. It's like someone beating you 6 0 and you're like, forget this, quit. It's like rage quitting a game. So 
that is, is always just a, a staggering thought to me. Um, despite the obvious importance of this topic, I think we should end on a slightly more optimistic note before yeah, I open yeah, yeah, questions to the floor. So we sort of briefly talked about this outside, but what's, the, what's your favourite interview that you've ever done? Favourite interview I've ever done? Um, uh, I would say... Except for this one. Obviously. Except for this one, yeah. Um, I think, weirdly, it was... Uh, it was the one, uh, one that was, was, was done on me uh, and, and I was the, the guest. It was my, when I came out of I'm a Celebrity, get me out of here. And I sat down and all of a sudden I'm, I've gone four and a half weeks living in rubbish. And it is horrendous. It's horrendous. Incredible show, incredible show, but, but uh, it is worse than you think. Like, you think people are handing you sandwiches? No, 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 no. This is awful, right? It's awful. Um, and I come out and all of a sudden I'm sat there and I'm third and people are calling me, uh, uh, people are calling me Ro. And, and I, uh, that's me, right? Roman Kemp is billboard person, right? It's a weird thing to all of a sudden people know you like in that sense. And it was a very overwhelming again feeling that I had. But it was incredible and it was this weird, like I was dreaming it, like I died and all of a sudden Ant and Deck are showing me a highlight reel of everything I'd been doing over the last four weeks and I didn't even realise a camera crew were even there. And then all of a sudden I'm getting messages from my parents who I haven't seen and all I've done is cry and think about them. and. That was, was a crazy, crazy experience. So I'd either say that or Scarlett Johansson because she's really lovely. <laughs> um, thank, you, thank you very much. Um, now, questions from the floor. If any of you have any questions for um, Roman. Rose, Don't make it awkward, um, just ask questions because uh, otherwise I'll look rubbish. Roman the puffer jacket. Um. Um. First of all, I just wanted to say thank you for coming here and for your talk. And also, I'm sure many people have said, um, just thank you for the work that you've done on men's mental health. Sure. Um, I already did a four-year degree and I decided to do another three-year degree here precisely, well, for similar reasons, because I felt like banking and finance were great, but there was something inherently wrong with the world if people thought there's nothing to do but to kill myself. Yeah. And Antidepressants are amazing. Pharmacology has come a long way. Therapy has as well. But meaning seems to be something that we have a crisis of. There's this crisis of meaning. Um, a lot of authors have written about it before. Sometimes it was religion, spirituality. Then it was ideology in the 20th century. And then we figured out, well, maybe that's not the best place to derive your meaning from. Yep. So now we're in this weird liminal space of secular meaning. And the response is, go find it yourself. Go find your passion. Go do your thing. For some, that's easy, but when you're working three shifts and you've got five kids and your mortgage is coming down and you're the sole mother or the sole father, yeah. that's tough. There's no one size fits all. So what's, I know that's kind of a heavy question, I'm sorry to open that, yeah. but with this crisis of meaning that we're living in, where it isn't just, oh, find Jesus or, oh, find whatever, it's go find it yourself. What yeah. do we signpost? What do we tell young men? The antidepressants give them time, or young women as well, the antidepressants give them time to figure things out, yeah. and everybody's experience is different, but the meaning has to be found outside of the medication so often. Yeah, uh, it's a brilliant question. Uh, I, uh, I think that you're so right, and, and this is exactly what my next step is, that for me, in terms of mental health, uh, what, what I want to do or at least try and use my platform for as much as possible, which is that, that feeling of being lost and not understanding what we're doing, that will happen to everyone at some point in their life. I personally believe that someone, every single person on the planet goes through depression at some point in their life, whether that be for five minutes over a football score or for 10 years, whatever, right, or for their life. The only way to get over that feeling of I have to have meaning within society, I have to have uh, a, a job, I have to do this, otherwise I'm a failure or I'm this, I'm that, 
That is one, it's not understanding how to feel positive within yourself. And it's a lack of understanding of, of a, a, an attitude in your mind to, to pull you out of a, a mental health crisis. And that will only happen if from the age of five, kids are taught about what we will experience when we're older. You know, if, if, if when we were younger, if we were taught an understanding about, you know, at some point you, you may feel like you're lacking meaning, you know, you may feel this, just know that, that it's a completely natural thing to feel and, and you can help your brain to, to, to fight against dark thoughts and et cetera. That is an incredibly powerful thing. And it can come, you know, I've spoken to professors who, who think that a positive mental attitude needs to happen and, and be taught to kids whilst they're in the womb. You know, you should be bringing positive affirmations to your child through there. So it builds in this world where, you know, talking about emotions, understanding uh, things like depression from the age of like five, is, is perfectly normal. And that is the only way that we can kind of change this. That mindset of looking for meaning, and, and it all comes at the same time for everyone. It comes around when we start going through puberty. You know, for boys, we're like 16 and you know, checking how many pubes you've got that day. Do you know what I mean? It's like, you know, who am I? I I'm meant to be a man, I'm meant to be this. At that point, from the age of 16, you no longer will put in your head oh, maybe I should open up to these people about my insecurities. After 16, you're, you're in intervention mode. You are a professional at wearing your own mask and showing people how you're really feeling. So it's imperative to me that, that an education on mental health and what the damage it can do, but how you can overcome it in moments like that, right, comes at such an early age. And that's why uh, the, big, the big plan is in five years, I would love to see, um, I would love to see uh, mental health, things like depression, even things like bipolar disorder, um, uh, understanding of, of emotion, etc. I would love to see that as part of a biology curriculum for GCSE students and potentially younger. It doesn't make sense to me. It feels quite draconian to me that, that we still live in a world now where it's not really talked about until you're at A level and you can do psychology. It feels very strange, very, very strange. Why, at, when I was doing GCSEs, I was having to draw a full thing of the heart, tell you what each valve does, does this, this, that, respiratory system does this. My brain is just as powerful as my heart. Why, why am I not learning what that can do? This can, make, this can turn against me. You know, a doctor can, can help this, you know, with, with an operation, but this, this can really mess me up. And, and it's that that I truly believe that if, if, we can, if we can get that into school as early as possible, you'll, you'll stop a lot of that feeling. Thank you very much. Thanks. Any other questions? Please raise your hands uh, now. The, the honourable member in the front row. Um, hi, that sounds a bit lame, this sounds a bit lame after that question, but um, <laughs> I just wondered, because you've done I'm a Celeb, would you, are there any other shows that you want to do like Strictly or like Celebrity um, Bake Off or anything I, like that? I, I have said this, I, I won't do Strictly, I don't think I'll ever do it, I don't think I'll ever do it, if I'm totally honest, right, I, I think that it's a fantastic show, again, really is, and I, and I have huge respect for people that do it. I had my co-host, uh, Vic Hope, did it whilst I was with her on the, on when she did Capital Breakfast. It's so intense. It's so difficult. Um, I would have done it if my nan was alive, right? I'd, I'd, honestly, I would have done it. If she was alive, I would have said, fair, I'll do it for you. I've not really got anyone for, to do it for. I'm a celeb, I did it for me. I love I'm a celeb. Like, I've watched that show since the day it started. Like, and, and I loved it and I couldn't believe it when I was there. Um, and, and I think that's always been my thing. If, uh, every job that I've chosen, I promise you, is, is am I going to find this fun? And that's, or, or does it mean something to me? You know, so I, I think that strictly, I don't know if I'd find it fun. Celebrity Bake Off? Yes, 100%. Celebrity Master Chef? Uh, yeah, like those, okay, fine. Like Bake Off, I've actually like, I've actually 
been quite annoyed at Channel 4 that they haven't asked me yet. <laughs> Didn't your dad do it? Yeah, my dad did it. My dad burnt buttercream. <laughs> <laughs> like, idiot. Do you know what I mean? So I always say to Channel 4, I'm like, oh, you need to get me in to at least save my family's name. <laughs> so yeah, so not really strictly, but like other things, yeah. Absolutely not. <laughs> Absolutely not. Because uh, cause Sonny J, who I do my radio show with, he won it. So if I came anything less than win it, then I'd be worse than him. I can't deal with that on a daily basis. Look forward to seeing you on Celebrity Bake Off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, any other questions? Um, the honourable member in the white hoodie. You can shout from there if you want. Thanks right. for the recording. Yeah, for the, yeah of course. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for for speaking to us. Um, oh. I wanted to ask: Do you think that it is difficult for people from, let's say, different backgrounds to understand how exactly they can find help with mental health issues? So, um, to elaborate, I come from a background where mental health is not really very well understood, especially not for men. And I remember, you know, being very avidly told you to, you know, man up or stuff like that. And um, on top of that, what would, you say it, what would you say would be the best place to go first if someone felt that they were dealing poorly with mental health? Thanks. Yeah, no, but it's a, it's a great question. And, and look, I'm hugely, hugely privileged. And again, it's something that I'm so aware of to be, I mean, look, I, I'm, I'm a white celebrity male who says I'm struggling mentally. I will have access to every bit of help that I want. And my parents are understanding of that because of the background that they're from. I've got friends that are exactly the same. You know, I've got friends that come from backgrounds where they still haven't come out to their parents. You know, and, and it is super, super difficult. Luckily, doing things like this or, or, or being able to open up that conversation normalises it and gives you that power, you know, to be able to be honest with yourself about your mental health. And there are a lot of things out there, you know, there, there's a lot of outlets. And that's why I say, you know, is mental health that talk about it getting better? Yeah, it is getting better. I th I, I've got to be honest, like, I think, I still to this day think it was absolutely outrageous and, and a disgrace that during lockdown, during something that took more of a mental toll on people, than we could have ever imagined. Throughout lockdown, I didn't see one advert on TV about if you're struggling mentally with what's going on, call this number, go here, do this. From the government, none. And again, I'm not a government lobbyist, but didn't see one thing. And, and that is gross misconduct, in, in my opinion, you know. But, but luckily, you know, you being here, again, opens up a topic and hopefully you're seeing other people talk about their mental health and people opening up, you know, you, you just, you, you know, you, you, your colleague kind of asked the question and it's, it's something that we're all going to have to take, take responsibility of. We're going to have to do, take responsibility not just for ourselves, but of our mates. And that's, that's where that 2 OK rule came in that, that came from that documentary that I did. And for those that, that haven't watched it, um, uh, I met a group of lads um, who lost their mate. They were only 16. And, um, and they were like, I said to them, you know, how do you, how'd you deal with it now? How do you, how'd you safeguard each other? And they said, well, we ask each other, are we okay twice? And I was like, what do you mean? And they were like, well, at the beginning of the conversation, weirdly, are you okay is, is the thing that has now become whatever, you know? You all right? Hey, how are you? Yeah, I'm good, yeah. Anyway, where are you going out tonight? That's how a conversation goes, specifically around British people. American people, you say, how are you? And they're like, oh my God, I'm so great, and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but, but we're British people, you know, we're miserable sometimes. And, uh, and I think that that thing of just at the end of a conversation, stopping and saying, yeah, but really, how are you? Not only are you disarming that person that you're talking to by leaving it towards the end of the conversation, they've opened up a little bit already. It's almost like a life hack. I found that these kids, you know, these young lads gave me and I was like entirely grateful for it. I was like, I want to push this message. Can, can I do that? And they, they gave me their blessing to do it. So something you can all choose on. I always say to, to, to everyone whenever I do a talk, pick three people in your phone book. 
after this, genuine, right? Pick three people in your phone book that you in your head don't think they might be struggling. Don't pick those people. Pick the three people that you think life is sick for them right now and text them, how are you? Have a little bit of chat and then say, no, but really, really, are, are you okay? I guarantee you that you will find something new about that person, guarantee. And, and, and if you don't, I'll buy you a drink. Uh, genuinely, it's ridiculous. Um, sorry, I've gone off on a tangent. I do it all the time, that's why I do radio. But yes, there are lots of places now that, that and, and again, it's what go back to what I say is, fortunately as a society, we are talking about it more. It's gonna take time, but you know, what's, what's happening here slowly will, I'm sure, branch out to other communities and, and open it up, that conversation there. I, I think we have time for one more question. So we'll go to the member from, I think, Oriel College in the front row. Um, I know the college puff is just about well enough. <laughs> what's college? What? What is it? What college? Oriel College. What's that? It's so just, Oxford University has lots of different it's colleges. Just a college. that they cool. <laughs> like houses, I guess. Cool. But, um, we're not very popular. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Everyone thinks we're Tories. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I see. Bad reputation. Bad reputation. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Let's yeah, talk about that. Yeah, good no, no, I'm kidding. No, um, no, no. I was just going to say, do you, obviously you get to talk to a lot of um, other celebrities, and, and I would assume you know quite a lot of them on a closer basis. Yeah. What do you think about the sort of um, glorification of the celebrity lifestyle? Because I think it's very yeah. obviously. I'm. I think everyone's aware of the, the how bad the media can be yeah. and how vicious they can be. Um, but from a lot of sort of what we see, yeah. um, it's very easy to, to think, oh, that's, that's amazing. You know, when we're all on a tight deadline and we see Met Gala photos and that's sort of yeah, thing, it's like, yeah, oh, yeah. wow, that looks great. Yeah, but be honest, um, when you see some of them Met Gala outfits, oh, you're I like, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, but, I, I, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 on glorification, I, I, I actually had this chat with someone recently, um, just a cab driver. Um, and I think ambition is the most powerful thing that, that you can have as, as, a, as a person, you know. Uh, uh, ambition is, is the reason why you're all here, is the reason why you're all at this university, is because, you know, you guys can, you've got dreams that you want to go on and do something, and you, you've got people, each, you know, you've got different people that you look up to and, and, and you want to, you know, progress to. I love looking at people on stage and thinking, wow, a fellow human has done that, you know, and, and it's in something to, to look at and, and see, and, and it's incredibly powerful to see that. I do think that sometimes things like social media are blamed too much. You know, the number one question I always get, especially around suicide is, oh, social media, isn't it? That's why kids are killing themselves. People are reunited through, lost families are reunited through social media. Police are helped through social media. You know, loads of positives come from, come from that platform. And I do think that if you can build, going back again to what I said, building your own positive mental attitude and, and being able to, to bring that to kids from as young as possible age, when it comes to looking at celebrities for them in the future, they won't see it and go, oh, woe is me, I, you know, I'm never going to get that. Those kids that you've instilled a positive mindset into will be like, I'm going to do that. I can go up there and I can be that person. And that is, is super, super powerful. It's the most attractive quality that I think a person can have, like uh, ambition. You know, when I, when I started doing presenting, uh, when people say, well, so what do you want to be? I want to be the best presenter on the planet. What's the point if I say anything else? Literally, what's the point if I say anything else? Like, I want to be mediocre, and that's about it. The only way I have that ambition is by seeing celebrities and seeing people that, that are out there doing it. You know, the media can say, you know, they're a celebrity, but at the end of the day, they're not. That's someone living their dream, you know? And that's where it's impressive. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. One last thing for me, we sure. ask all of our speakers uh, this. Yep. Um, in two sentences or, or, or fewer, uh -huh. um, what advice would you give to the members of the Oxford Union and of the Oxford University to take forward into the rest of their lives? Number one thing, uh, my mum told me this when I was a kid and 
is what I will live by all the time. It's the fact that I grew up and everyone would just say, because I had famous parents, if ever I did an achievement, had an achievement, everyone would say, oh, you're lucky. And people will say that to you all through your life because I'm, I'm sure that a lot of you might come from, you know, bad backgrounds or low income backgrounds or high income backgrounds, no matter what, it is down to you. And if people say to you that you're lucky, you know, oh, you got that job because you were lucky you went to Oxford. Not the case. Breaking down the definition of luck is when preparation meets opportunity. And that is what you should live by. Your prep and what you have done up to that point, all that's happened is that a moment has occurred where you can use everything that you've waited for and, and studied for and done. That is your opportunity. That opportunity has, has risen. And that is what creates that moment that people look at and go, wow, that was lucky. It's not lucky. You worked for that. That's it. Perfect. Thank you. Now, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Roman Kemp for the fantastic. Oh, thanks so much. Thank you. I'm sorry I was late. <laughs>